to the useless electron, long may it be so. So went a turn-of-the-century dinner toast at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, England, where the electron was first discovered. Moonshine, pure moonshine. That's what Ernest Rutherford, one of the pioneers in the study of the atom, said about nuclear power. Seldom have so many been so wrong, and seldom have so few been so important. This is the story of human beings and the atom. It all began, as so much in science did, about 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece. And here the world's first scientists lived and wondered and asked the big questions. Questions like, what is the world made of? One of these scientists, a man named Democritus, would sit here in the central marketplace of Athens and explain to one and all how all things on earth and in the heavens are made of extremely tiny particles. He called them atoms. These atoms combine and uncombine, arrange and rearrange themselves into air, earth, fire, and water, into trees and stones into ships and sails, into frogs and human beings. The trees and frogs and human beings live and die. The atoms are eternal. Thus claimed Democritus, the atoms that now live in my brain once lived in the brain of Homer and will live in the brains of all the scientists to follow us down the corridors of time. It was a pretty theory, but not many believed him. And perhaps they thought he was joking, for Democritus was called the laughing philosopher. And Democritus had very little evidence, but then neither did anyone else for their own theories about the world and the stuff it was made of. And it would be well over 2,000 years before such evidence was to come into the world. When it did, it would make the concept of the atom one of the most important and the most powerful of all scientific ideas and it would make an understanding of this concept one of the keys to scientific literacy in our own 21st century. Now the first really big steps forward after Democritus were taken about the time of our American Revolution. Three men, each strikingly different, played crucial roles. One is now honored by a statue in his hometown in England. This was the same town, though, that once bred a mob that burned down his house to protest his democratic political views. He was a Unitarian minister and a friend of Benjamin Franklin. He discovered the element oxygen, made the first artificial gas, and the first bottle of soda pop. His name was Joseph Priestley. The second was an eccentric English millionaire who hated money, polite society, and women as much as he loved working alone in his London townhouse. And here he discovered a new gas, hydrogen. Here he was the first to figure out that water was a compound of hydrogen and oxygen. And here he was the first man to actually weigh the earth. His name was Henry Cavendish. Oh, the third pioneer was an aristocratic Frenchman who gets credit for solving the ancient mystery of fire. For replacing the outdated phlogiston theory of fire with a modern oxidation theory. All this and more before losing his head to the guillotine in the French Revolution. The Republic has no need of philosophers, said the new president of France, as he sent Antoine Lavoisier to his death. Well, Priestley, Cavendish, and Lavoisier were at their best in the experimental laboratory, puzzling their way through a mass of often irrelevant data to discover new chemical facts. The man who wove those patterns of fact into a tapestry of rich and effective theory was just the opposite. Clumsy and slipshod in the laboratory, but brilliant in the study. His first study was at a small Quaker school in Kendall, here on the border of the beautiful lake country of northwestern England. That school, remodeled and expanded, is still in use today. The man was a poor English schoolmaster, John Dalton. Dalton advertised for pupils and was paid per subject taught. 
He was only a teenager himself, a poor speaker and colorblind to boot. Dalton had his hands full at Kendall. Nevertheless, in between teaching and trying to discipline students often as old as he was, Dalton taught himself chemistry and began to fashion the key that would unlock a treasure chest of richness and power over the next two centuries, and that key was the first modern atomic theory. Dalton's idea of the atom was similar to that of Democritus, but there was one enormous difference. Dalton had solid experimental evidence to back him up. Dalton knew, for instance, that when chemical elements like carbon and oxygen combined to make carbon monoxide in one case and carbon dioxide in another, they always do so in simple whole number ratios. One part oxygen by weight, that is, combines with a given amount of carbon to make carbon monoxide. Now, to get carbon dioxide, you have to exactly double the amount of oxygen. And so, too, with every chemical compound then known. The elements that make it up always combine in definite proportions. And if the same elements form more than one compound, the proportions are always simple whole number ratios. Why? asked Dalton. The answer, he said, is simple. Each element is made of atoms. And the atoms are, well, like little round billiard balls. An atom of oxygen could combine with an atom of carbon, but it would have to be all or none. So you could have one to one, or you could have two atoms of oxygen with one of carbon, or three or four. But at any rate, it could only be in whole numbers. This hypothesis of Dalton proved to be one of the most fertile in all scientific history. And no one yet, it is true, had any direct evidence for these tiny atoms. No one, that is, has actually seen them. But after Dalton, the indirect evidence and the usefulness of atomic theory quickly became overwhelming. Some examples. Boyle's Law, that the product of the pressure and volume in a gas was a constant. Avogadro's hypothesis that equal volumes of gases contain equal numbers of molecules, and the erratic careening of spores under a microscope, first noticed by Robert Brown and later called Brownian movement. All these and more were simply and elegantly explained by assuming all matter is made of atoms, and even more important, by so assuming, one knew where to look for still more important game. Well, by the middle of the 19th century, as more elements were being discovered, and hence more different kinds of atoms, along came a bearded Russian, Dmitri Mendeleev, who liked to play cards. Mendeleev would write the names of all the elements then known on cards, along with their properties, including their atomic weights. And then he would sort these cards in as many ways as he could think of, searching for a pattern. And here is the pattern he found, the periodic table of the elements. When Mendeleev first made it up, it wasn't complete. Only 63 elements had been discovered by then, that is 63 different kinds of atoms. And when he arranged his 63 cards in rows and columns, he noticed that when the rows were seven across, the columns down always had elements with much in common. But occasionally, there was a gap. Well, there is an element as yet undiscovered, proclaimed Mendeleev with great chutzpah. I have named it Eka Aluminum. By properties similar to those of the metal aluminum, you shall identify it. Seek, and it will be found. And, by golly, he was right. It was found. Since it was found in France, it was named gallium. Now, Mendeleev predicted two other elements, and they too were found just as he said they would be. Well, by the end of the 19th century, the periodic table had grown a lot. Atomic theory was proving clear and useful. Some not-so-imaginative scientists thought, well, we had it all wrapped up. But they were dead wrong. New facts about the atom around the turn of the century were to bring a new revolution in both science and society. 
a revolution we're still trying to control and understand. Now, the first shot in this revolution was fired in 1895 in Germany by a man named William Runchen. Runchen was experimenting at the University of Würzburg in Bavaria with high-voltage <laughs> tubes when he noticed some strange, invisible rays coming out of his tubes. These rays, he found, easily penetrated the skin of people, giving them pictures of their bones. He called the mysterious unknown rays X-rays. Well, almost as soon as he published his findings, he and his X-rays became world famous. The New Jersey legislature, in fact, tried to pass a law banning X-rays from use in opera glasses in order to protect the modesty of ladies. But the big question for science was, where are these unknown rays coming from? What are they? And within months, another startling discovery was made in Paris. Henri Becquerel found that a plain chunk of uranium would darken photographic plates. Something, in other words, we know not what, seemed to be coming out of the uranium atoms. Marie and Pierre Curie at the University of Paris were working in their garage and finding still more rays and penetrating particles that came out of an element that they discovered and called radium. But what was happening to the uranium and the radium atoms that caused them to emit these powerful particles and rays? And most amazing of all, to change themselves into smaller, simpler atoms in the process. Marie Curie and others were finding that the medieval alchemists were right. One element could be changed into another. And then William Crookes took a tube like this, a glass tube, and took all the air out of it. Then put a high voltage across the tube. He saw a ghostly column of light. But was it light? When he put a magnet near it, the spooky column of light bent. And J.J. Thompson at Cavendish Lab in England was the first to recognize that that glow in the Crookes tube was a stream of fast-moving, he called them electrons. And more important, those electrons seemed to be coming right out of the atom itself. Dalton's little atoms were spitting out seeds. Well, soon Cavendish Lab and other centers were finding that besides the negatively charged electrons, the atom had positively charged particles as well. These were later called protons. But then the question arose, how were protons and electrons put together in the normal neutral atom? Well, the most important single breakthrough in sketching out a picture of the inner structure of the atom came at the University of Manchester in England in the lab of a rough young New Zealander, Ernest Rutherford. Though it was known that atoms were made of electrons and protons now, no one knew how they were stuck together. Was the atom a sort of plum pudding? Well, if not that, what? Well, one day, one of Rutherford's assistants came rushing into his office to show him some remarkable data from a new experiment. In a vacuum chamber, Rutherford had been bombarding thin sheets of metal foil with fast-moving alpha particles. These are positively charged particles about the same size as a small atom itself. Now, if the atom was a kind of plum pudding of protons and electrons, as Thompson had proposed, the alpha particles should pass through mostly undeflected. But that is not what happened. Most of the alpha particles did pass through undeflected, but a few, a very few, bounced back as though they had hit a brick wall. It was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life, Rutherford said later. It was almost as incredible as if you had fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. In a very short time, Rutherford took that data into his study and sketched out a whole new picture of what the atom might look like. He imagined a kind of miniature solar system with a very dense, positively charged nucleus surrounded by streams of high-speed electrons, the planets around the sun. And the dimensions of that solar system atom were staggering, to say the least. 
if, for instance, you enlarge the nucleus of a single atom to the size of a period on a piece of paper, the electrons would be buzzing around in a space as large as a large classroom. And that, he said, you see, explains why most of the alpha particles could go right through without seeming to hit anything. But occasionally, very occasionally, one would hit the brick wall, the nucleus. The surprises were only beginning now. During the next 50 years, physicists and chemists would change the world with the power of their ideas as they would astound the philosophers with the wonder of the new mysteries. Niels Bohr from Denmark studied the fingerprints of the atoms, those colored spectral lines emitted by glowing elements. He guessed that these lines, so definite and so pure, came from definite, he called them quantum leaps, within the electronic structure of the individual atoms of any element. Working with this guess, he constructed still another, more sophisticated picture of what the inside of an atom might look like. Bohr's picture of the atom was in turn replaced by a still more sophisticated one, where the electrons became wave particles surrounding the nucleus in clouds of probability. These clouds of probability were not vague dreams, they were mathematically precise. Physicists could use them to predict atomic behavior. Chemists could use them in thousands of bond studies to come. In fact, most of modern chemistry and a great deal of modern biology is built on the foundation laid by these pioneers of basic physics. The electron clouds of the atom were one thing. The hard nucleus core was another. It too was probed deeper and deeper. And like a series of Chinese boxes within boxes within boxes, it began to reveal itself in all its mystery and power. In the middle of the Depression, with Hitler coming to power in Europe, a scientist in Cavendish Laboratory, James Chadwick, found that besides protons and electrons, there was a third particle in the atom, the neutron. And the neutron was somehow stuck in that hard nucleus core. It was noticed, too, that all atoms of a given element were not exactly alike. Each element had atoms that always had the same number of electrons and protons, but differing numbers of neutrons. And some of these isotopes of an element, as they came to be called, were unstable. Well, this helped explain why the radium and uranium that Marie Curie and others had worked with broke apart in an unpredictable and highly energetic way. Highly energetic indeed, conforming exactly to Einstein's new equation, E equals mc squared. Scientists probing the atom began to wonder whether Rutherford was right when he labeled the idea of atomic power moonshine. There seemed to be more power there than anyone had ever dreamed. Two tracks of science, the wonder and the power, converged to unlock the secrets of that atomic nucleus. As Hitler and Stalin came along in the 1930s, as the Second World War approached, the race to unlock those secrets turned desperate. Many of the world's greatest scientists, men like Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Edward Teller, Enrico Fermi, and others, fled Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy to continue their work in the free world of England and America. Some remained in Germany of their own free will and others by compulsion to work on atomic energy and its possible use in warfare. In the United States, Enrico Fermi led a team of scientists here at the University of Chicago. They constructed the world's first working nuclear pile. They did it on this site, which used to be the squash court under the old football stadium. Here at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, a giant government-built factory began to separate the isotopes of uranium, normal U-238, from the U-235, capable of fission. At Alamogordo, New Mexico, July 16, 1945, 5.30 a.m., the first atomic explosion was detonated. And less than a month later, the first atomic bombs were used in warfare. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, were devastated, and the most destructive war in human history was ended. No, the electron was not useless. 
and no nuclear energy was not moonshine. And today, the power of that atom is leading scientists and citizens ever closer to utopia or to annihilation. And the wonder of the atom is leading scientists and citizens ever closer to that mystery of mysteries, creation itself.